I sat in the stark white waiting room of the hospital, my phone screen barely held my attention. The repetitive visits had become a routine over the last decade, ever since Sally, my mother-in-law, had been confined to a wheelchair. The accident that had stripped her of her mobility seemed like a distant memory, yet its consequences were part of our daily lives. I was about to check another email when a voice interrupted my focus. Excuse me, you're Sally's daughter, right? The man who stood before me wore the familiar teal scrubs of the hospital staff, yet his face was unfamiliar. His question caught me off guard, not only because Sally was actually my mother-in-law, but also because her primary doctor was a woman, and I hadn't been informed of any changes. Yes, I'm her daughter-in-law. Is everything okay? My voice betrayed a hint of concern. The man's expression was earnest, tinged with urgency that set my heart racing. I'm Dr. Logan. I recently joined the team here. There's something about your mother-in-law's condition I need to discuss with you. It's quite urgent. His gaze held mine, compelling me to pay attention. A flurry of thoughts raced through my mind. Sally's condition had been stable, albeit without improvement for years. What could possibly have changed? But isn't Dr. Emma handling her case? Why would you need to talk to me about it? I questioned, my confusion growing. Dr. Logan glanced around the waiting room, lowering his voice. It's a matter that Dr. Emma isn't aware of yet. I stumbled upon something concerning during a routine check and thought it best to bring it directly to you. His words sent a chill down my spine. Sally had become more than just a mother-in-law to me over the years. She was family. The thought of her suffering or being in danger filled me with a sense of dread. Let's talk then. But please, make it quick. Sally will be wondering where I've gone off to. He nodded, gesturing for me to follow him to a small consultation room. As we walked, I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. What could possibly be so urgent and secretive that it couldn't be shared with Sally or her primary doctor? Little did I know, this conversation would be the beginning of an unravelling that would change everything. As Dr. Logan led me down the corridor, my mind wandered back to the beginning, to how I found myself entwined in Sally's life. I grew up in a single-parent family. My mother, Emily, left when I was just a child. My father, a stern but loving man, raised me on his own, always painting my mother in a negative light. He told me she was a spendthrift who treated us poorly and ultimately ran off with a younger man. Despite his bitterness, my father was my rock, working tirelessly to provide for me ensuring I never felt the lack of a mother's love. It was during my early years of independence, after college and starting a job at a small company, that I met Benjamin. He was kind, with a gentle strength that drew me in. We married after a whirlwind romance, and I was warmly welcomed into his family by his mother, Sally. With Benjamin's father having passed away a few years before our wedding, Sally lived alone, and she treated me like the daughter she never had. Our bond was instant and deep. However, our lives took a dramatic turn when, four years into our marriage, Sally was involved in a car accident. The vibrant, energetic woman I knew was suddenly bound to a wheelchair, her independence stripped away in an instant. Her once cheerful demeanour faded, replaced by a withdrawn, sombre shadow of her former self. It was heart-wrenching to see her struggle with her new reality, her mobility limited, her spirit broken. As the years passed, various caregivers came and went, but none seemed to fit well with Sally. She often expressed feeling lonely and abandoned, a sentiment that grew so intense we could no longer ignore her pleas for company. Concerned for her well-being, Benjamin and I made the difficult decision to move back into the family home to provide her with the care and companionship she so desperately craved. I remember how relieved she seemed when we first moved back, I mused aloud, not realising I had spoken my thoughts. Dr. Logan glanced at me, a sympathetic look in his eyes. It must have been a significant change for all of you, he remarked as we reached the consultation room. It was, I agreed, my heart heavy with the memory. At first it felt like the right thing to do. Sally's smiles returned, and the house felt like a home again. But as soon as we mentioned returning to work, her entire demeanour changed. She became almost hysterical at the thought of being left alone again. Benjamin and I had hoped our presence would be a temporary comfort, enough to get her through the toughest times. But as days turned into weeks, and weeks into months, 
it became clear that Sally's dependency on us was growing stronger. The burden of her care began to weigh heavily on our shoulders, reshaping our lives in ways we hadn't anticipated. Our careers, our personal time, even our relationship were all affected. We were no longer just a married couple. We were full-time caregivers, a role neither of us was prepared for. As we sat down in the consultation room, I couldn't help but feel a twinge of resentment for the sacrifices we had made. Yet looking into Dr. Logan's concerned eyes, I was reminded of the deep love that had driven us to make those choices. Love for a woman who had welcomed me with open arms, treating me as her own at a time when I had no mother of my own. It was this love that had compelled us to bear the weight of this family's burden, a burden we carried with a mix of reluctance and unwavering commitment. Dr. Logan closed the door behind us, offering a semblance of privacy in the small sterile room. The fluorescent lights hummed overhead, casting a harsh glow that seemed to underscore the gravity of our situation. As I settled into the stiff chair across from him, my mind was a whirlwind of emotions, primarily centred around the deep-seated resentment that had been building over the years. Isabella, I can only imagine how difficult this has been for you and your husband, Dr. Logan began, his voice soft yet firm. Caring for a loved one is an enormous responsibility. I sighed, the weight of the past decade pressing down on me. It's more than just a responsibility, Dr. Logan. It's our entire life. Our personal time, our relationship, everything has been consumed by the need to care for Sally. Benjamin and I had entered this arrangement with the best of intentions, but as the years passed, the toll it took on us became increasingly apparent. Our evenings and weekends, once filled with small adventures and shared dreams, were now dedicated to Sally's care. Our conversations, once light and filled with laughter, had become logistical discussions about medications doctor's appointments and physical therapy sessions. I remember the last time Benjamin and I tried to have a date night, I shared with Dr. Logan, the memory bittersweet. We were just sitting down to dinner when Sally called. She was upset, feeling lonely and abandoned. We ended up bringing our meals home and spending the evening watching TV with her instead. The strain was not just emotional but physical as well. The constant vigilance, the lifting and the adjustments to our home to make it more accessible for Sally left us both exhausted. But it was the impact on our relationship that hurt the most. Benjamin and I had become caretakers first and spouses second, our intimacy eroded by the never-ending demands of Sally's care. And Benjamin? Dr. Logan inquired gently, breaking into my thoughts. Benjamin does what he can. He comes home on weekends and takes time off when possible. But it's not enough. It's never enough. My voice cracked with the strain of unshed tears. Sally's condition hasn't improved, and it feels like we're trapped in this endless cycle of care. Dr. Logan nodded, his expression one of empathy. It's a common feeling among caregivers. The sense of being trapped, the resentment. It's all part of the emotional toll it takes on you. The truth of his words hit me hard. I had always prided myself on being strong on being able to handle whatever life threw my way. But sitting in that consultation room, facing the reality of our situation, I felt anything but strong. The resentment I felt towards Sally for her dependency, towards Benjamin for his absences, and even towards myself for not being able to cope better, was a heavy burden to bear. I just... I miss my husband, I confessed, the words barely above a whisper. I miss us. Dr. Logan reached across the small desk, offering a tissue for the tears that had finally begun to fall. It's okay to feel this way, Isabella. Acknowledging these feelings is the first step towards addressing them. As I dabbed at my eyes, I couldn't help but wonder if there was a way out of this cycle, a way to reclaim our lives while still ensuring Sally received the care she needed. It was a question that had plagued me for years, and one that I hoped Dr. Logan might help us answer. But as we prepared to delve deeper into the conversation, I couldn't shake the feeling that the revelations to come would challenge everything I thought I knew about our family's burden. The silence in the room felt heavy, a tangible pressure against my chest, as I waited for Dr. Logan to speak. He seemed to be choosing his words carefully, aware of the impact they were about to have. The empathy in his eyes did little to calm the growing apprehension within me. 
Isabella, the reason I asked to speak with you privately is because I've discovered something about Sally's condition that, well, it's unusual, Dr. Logan began, his voice steady but filled with a seriousness that immediately set me on edge. What is it? Is she okay? My voice was laced with worry. Despite the resentment and the toll her care had taken on our lives, Sally was family. The thought of her suffering or being in any sort of pain was unbearable. Dr. Logan took a deep breath before continuing. I was reviewing Sally's recent tests and, there's no easy way to say this, the results suggest that there might not be a physical reason for her inability to walk. I stared at him, confusion and disbelief washing over me. I don't understand. She's been wheelchair bound for years. Are you saying it's all been in her head? He hesitated, choosing his next words with care. It's not uncommon for patients to develop what we call a functional neurological disorder after a traumatic event. It's a condition where the physical symptoms are real to the patient, but they stem from psychological factors rather than physiological ones. The room spun around me as I tried to process his words. Sally's struggle, the years of care, our sacrificed personal lives. Could it all have been for a condition that was psychological in nature? But why wouldn't her primary doctor, Dr. Emma, have noticed this? I asked, a hint of anger creeping into my voice. How could such a significant detail have been overlooked for so long? That's part of what concerns me, Dr. Logan admitted. I believe Dr. Emma might have been too close to the situation, too invested in the initial diagnosis, to consider alternative explanations. That's why I wanted to bring this to your attention directly. I think it's time for a new evaluation, perhaps even involving specialists who can offer a fresh perspective. The revelation left me reeling. The implications were enormous, not just for Sally, but for our entire family. Had we been living under the weight of a misdiagnosis? Had our lives been upended for a condition that could have been treated differently from the start? I need to talk to Sally about this, I said, the words coming out more as a declaration than a suggestion. Dr. Logan nodded in agreement. I think that's a good idea, but it's important to approach the conversation with sensitivity. If Sally's condition is indeed psychological, acknowledging it can be a delicate matter. I stood up, my legs shaky but determined. Thank you, Dr. Logan. I, I need some time to think about how to handle this. As I left the consultation room, my mind was a whirlwind of emotions. Anger, confusion, hope and fear danced a chaotic tango, leaving me unsure of what the future held. But one thing was clear. This revelation was just the beginning. The truth about Sally's condition promised to unravel secrets and lies that had bound our family for years. Challenging everything I thought I knew about the woman I had come to care for as a mother. The walk back to Sally's examination room felt longer than usual, my steps heavy with the weight of Dr. Logan's revelations. Each thought was a tangled knot of betrayal and disbelief. How could we have been so blind? How much of Sally's condition had been a fabrication, a manipulation that kept Benjamin and me tethered to her side, sacrificing our lives on the altar of her supposed need? I paused outside the examination room, my hand hovering over the doorknob, bracing myself for the confrontation that awaited. The door swung open and there she was, Sally, looking up at me with those eyes that had pleaded for sympathy and care for so many years. But this time, I saw something different in her gaze. Was it guilt? Fear? Or simply the realization that her deceit was about to be laid bare? Sally, we need to talk, I said, my voice steady, despite the turmoil inside me. Dr. Logan made some discoveries about your condition. Her expression changed, a flicker of panic crossing her features before she composed herself. What kind of discoveries? she asked trying to maintain her usual tone of frailty. I took a deep breath, the words I had rehearsed with Dr. Logan ready at my lips. He believes there might not be a physical reason for your inability to walk, that it might be psychological. Sally's reaction was immediate and telling. She looked away, unable to meet my gaze, her silence speaking volumes. In that moment I knew, the years of care, the endless worry, the sacrifices, much of it could have been avoided. Anger bubbled up inside me, but I fought to keep it at bay. This was not the time for accusations. It was a moment for truth, 
Sally, why? The question was a whisper, a plea for some sliver of understanding. Her response was barely audible, a mix of defensiveness and resignation. That's not true. Who would tell you that? The realisation that Sally's actions had been driven by fear and selfishness rather than necessity was devastating. But it also brought a clarity I hadn't felt in years. I could not allow her manipulation to dictate our lives any longer. I left the room without another word. My decision made. The first call I made was to Benjamin, explaining everything that Dr. Logan had revealed and what I had learned from Sally. His shock mirrored my own, but in his voice, I also heard relief, a shared understanding that this was our chance to reclaim our lives. But before I left the family home, I returned to the hospital to discuss next steps with Dr. Logan. My attention was caught by a shout from the examination room that made me turn around. I looked inside and saw the unbelievable. Sally was standing. She was shuffling her feet, trying to retrieve something from the top shelf, completely oblivious to her inability to walk. That moment when I saw her standing there, unaware of my presence, was the last straw. Realizing that their whole life had been set up around a lie, I made the decision to leave and go to the police. The next call was to the police. It was a difficult conversation, explaining the suspicions and the years of deceit we had unknowingly lived under. They promised to investigate, to send someone to look into the matter further. It was more than I had hoped for, a small beacon of hope in the storm that had become our lives. Packing my things from the family home felt surreal, each item a reminder of the life I had built around Sally's needs. But with each box I filled, I felt a weight lifting from my shoulders. I was not abandoning Sally, I was escaping a prison of lies, one that had held me captive far too long. As I loaded the last of my belongings into the car, my phone buzzed with messages and calls from Sally. I couldn't bring myself to answer, not yet. I needed space, time to process the betrayal and to begin healing from the years of sacrifice. Driving away from the house, I didn't look back. Ahead of me lay uncertainty, but also freedom, a chance to rebuild my life with Benjamin, free from the shadows of deceit that had darkened our marriage. It was a new chapter. One filled with possibilities and the promise of a future unburdened by manipulation. The road ahead would not be easy. There would be questions, legal matters and the inevitable fallout from our decision. But for the first time in years I felt a spark of hope. Hope for reconciliation with Benjamin, for healing and for a life defined by our choices, not the whims of another. Escaping the lies was just the beginning, but it was a start. A chance to find our way back to each other and to the love that had been buried under the weight of a family's burden. The drive to my new temporary refuge was a blur, my mind a tumultuous sea of emotions. Once settled into the quiet solitude of a friend's guest room, the reality of my situation began to sink in. I had left the family home, the place where I had dedicated a decade of my life to caring for Sally. The weight of the decision pressed heavily on me, yet it was tempered by a burgeoning sense of liberation. It wasn't long before my phone, which I had silenced during the drive, began to light up with a barrage of notifications. Voicemails, texts, missed calls, all from Sally. Each alert was a reminder of the confrontation I could no longer avoid. Taking a deep breath, I steeled myself for the conversation I knew had to happen. I called her back, the phone shaking slightly in my hand as I listened to the dial tone. She answered almost immediately her voice a mixture of confusion and desperation. Isabella, where have you been? I've been trying to reach you all day. Sally, I began, my voice firmer than I felt. We need to talk about what's been happening, about your condition. There was a pause, a moment of silence that spoke volumes. Then, almost defiantly, she replied, What about it? I spoke with Dr. Logan, I continued. He told me about the tests, about how there might not be a physical reason for you not being able to walk. And then... I saw it myself. Her response was immediate, a panicked denial. That's not true. You don't understand. I need the wheelchair. I... Sally, I interrupted, the pain and betrayal sharpening my words. I saw you. After our conversation, I saw you walk. You've been lying to us, to me and Benjamin, for years. The line went quiet, the silence stretching between us like a chasm. Finally, Sally spoke, her voice cracking with emotion. 
I was afraid, Isabella. After the accident, when I started to get better, I thought you'd all leave. I couldn't be alone. I just, I just wanted to keep you close. Her admission, while heartbreaking, only served to fuel the sense of betrayal that had taken root within me. By lying to us? By manipulating us into giving up our lives to care for you? Sally, do you have any idea what we've sacrificed for you? I'm sorry, Isabella. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. Please, you have to understand, she pleaded, desperation evident in her voice. But the well of sympathy I had once harboured for Sally had run dry, replaced by a resolve forged from years of deception. I can't do this anymore, Sally. I'm not coming back. The police are involved now. They'll be looking into everything. No, please, Isabella, don't do this. We can talk about it. We can fix it, she begged. But her words fell on deaf ears. It's too late for that, I said, a finality in my voice that brooked no argument. Goodbye, Sally. Hanging up the phone, I felt a cascade of emotions wash over me. Anger, relief, sorrow. They melded into a complex tapestry of feeling that I couldn't fully comprehend. The decision to cut ties with Sally was not made lightly, but it was necessary. A step towards reclaiming the life that had been derailed by her deceit. In the days that followed, the police investigation unfolded, shedding light on the depth of Sally's deception. They interviewed doctors, reviewed medical records, and took statements from both Benjamin and me. With each revelation, the extent of Sally's manipulation became clearer, painting a picture of a woman so consumed by fear of loneliness that she was willing to sacrifice everything, including the trust and well-being of her own family. As the investigation continued, I found myself grappling with a maelstrom of emotions, betrayal and anger, warred with pity and sadness for a woman who, in her own twisted way, had sought to keep her family close, but beneath it all lay a burgeoning sense of freedom, a realization that, for the first time in years, my future was my own to shape. Cutting ties with Sally was the end of a painful chapter, but it also marked the beginning of a new journey, one where the truth, no matter how painful, had set me free. In the aftermath of my departure from Sally's house and the initiation of the police investigation, a new and unexpected twist emerged. Dr. Emma, Sally's longtime and trusted physician, was suddenly thrust into the spotlight, not as a caregiver, but as a co-conspirator in the deceit that had entangled my life for so long. The police, delving deeper into the case, uncovered evidence that Dr. Emma had been falsifying medical reports effectively endorsing Sally's feigned incapacity. It was a betrayal of professional trust on a profound level, one that not only facilitated Sally's deception, but also manipulated the healthcare system to support a lie. When confronted with the evidence, Dr. Emma's reaction was one of desperation. She vehemently denied any wrongdoing, insisting that her care for Sally had always been in good faith. However, as the investigation progressed, the undeniable proof of her complicity began to mount, leaving her with dwindling options. In a last-ditch effort to deflect the blame and salvage her crumbling career, Dr. Emma made an astonishing accusation. She claimed that Benjamin and I had been the masterminds behind the entire scheme, alleging that we had coerced her into supporting the ruse for financial gain. According to her, we had threatened her career and well-being, if she did not comply with our demands to maintain the illusion of Sally's disability. Her accusation was ludicrous, a clear attempt to muddy the waters and shift the focus away from her own misconduct. However, it added a layer of complexity to an already convoluted situation. The police were obligated to investigate all claims, no matter how unfounded, which meant that Benjamin and I found ourselves under scrutiny, defending our integrity against a baseless and offensive claim. The community's reaction was mixed, with some unable to believe that a respected doctor could engage in such deceit, while others were quick to cast doubt on our motives. The stress of the accusation, coupled with the ongoing legal proceedings, strained our relationship with the wider community and even among some of our friends. As we navigated this new ordeal, Benjamin and I stood firm in our truth, providing evidence of our innocence and the genuine care we had provided Sally over the years. We had bank statements, emails and a history of communication that clearly showed our concern for Sally's well-being. 
devoid of any financial motivation. The legal battle that ensued was draining, both emotionally and financially. Dr. Emma's attempt to implicate us not only sought to absolve her of responsibility, but also threatened to tarnish our reputations irreparably. We engaged a lawyer, prepared our defence and awaited our day in court, determined to clear our names and expose the true extent of the conspiracy that had ensnared us. Throughout this tumultuous period, our resolve was tested in ways we could never have imagined. The accusation forced us to confront not only the betrayal of a trusted medical professional, but also the fragility of our own positions within a narrative we had never intended to be a part of. It was a stark reminder of the power of truth and the lengths to which some would go to hide it. As the court date approached, we braced ourselves for the revelations that would come to light, hopeful that justice would prevail and the truth would vindicate us. The accusation had cast a long shadow over our lives, but we remained united, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead together. The legal proceedings and the cloud of Dr. Emma's accusations had taken a toll on our lives, leaving Benjamin and me in a state of constant stress. However, it was during one of our many visits to the hospital, as we navigated the complexities of our defence, that an unexpected encounter would shift the course of events dramatically and unearth secrets long buried. We were leaving a meeting with our lawyer, held in a quiet corner of the hospital's café, when a commotion at the main reception caught our attention. Dr. Emma, visibly agitated and arguing with a woman I did not recognise, was gesturing wildly, her voice rising above the din of the busy lobby. As we drew closer, curious about the confrontation, the woman turned to face Dr. Emma full on, and in that instant, something about her struck a chord in me, a familiarity in her eyes, her posture, something indefinable yet unmistakable. The argument seemed to pause, as if the world had taken a collective breath. Dr. Emma, catching sight of us, pointed accusingly in our direction, her earlier allegations hanging in the air like a toxic cloud. But it was the other woman's reaction to seeing me that halted everything. Her expression softened, a mix of surprise and recognition dawning on her features. Isabella, she whispered, her voice breaking through the noise, cutting straight to my core. The sound of my name on her lips felt both foreign and deeply familiar. Confusion reigned as I tried to place her, to connect the dots that seemed to be aligning in front of me. It was Benjamin who voiced the question swirling in all our minds. Do you know her, Isabella? Before I could respond, the woman stepped forward, her gaze locked on mine. I'm Emily, she said, her voice steady now, imbued with an emotion I couldn't quite place. Your mother. The revelation hit me like a physical blow, staggering in its implications. My mother, Emily, the woman my father had painted in such negative colours throughout my childhood, stood before me, not just as a figment of my past, but as a living, breathing part of my present. The confrontation with Dr. Emma suddenly paled in comparison to the enormity of this moment. As Emily and I stood there, the years of separation and misunderstanding stretching between us, it felt as though the universe had conspired to bring us to this point of reckoning. Emily explained that she had been alerted to the commotion by hospital staff, her role as the head doctor, granting her authority in such situations. But what she hadn't expected was to come face to face with the daughter she had lost contact with so many years ago. The story she told was a stark contrast to the narrative my father had crafted. After their divorce, Emily had worked tirelessly to rise through the ranks of the medical profession, her dedication often misconstrued as neglect. She spoke of her attempts to reach out, to maintain a connection, only to be rebuffed by my father, who had painted her absence as abandonment. As we talked, the pieces of my past began to realign, forming a picture vastly different from the one I had grown up believing. The pain of those lost years, the misunderstandings and the missed opportunities weighed heavily on us both. But amidst the tumult of emotions, there was also a glimmer of hope, a chance for reconciliation and understanding. Emily's presence, her willingness to open her heart to the daughter she had never stopped loving, offered a path forward, one that led away from the bitterness of the past and towards a future filled with possibilities. The revelation of Emily's identity and the truths she shared about our family's history were a balm to the wounds inflicted by the ongoing legal battle and Dr. Emma's accusations. 
In the midst of our struggle, we had found an unexpected ally, a piece of ourselves thought lost forever. As we left the hospital that day, the weight of the confrontation with Dr. Emma still looming over us, the encounter with Emily cast a new light on everything. The family secrets that had been exposed not only challenged the narratives we had been told, but also opened the door to healing and forgiveness. It was a reminder that, sometimes, in the darkest moments, we find the keys to unlock the chains that have held us captive, offering a chance to break free and embrace the truth of who we are and where we come from. The days following the revelation of Emily's identity were a whirlwind of emotions and decisions. Armed with the truth about my past and the newfound connection with my mother, I felt empowered to confront the other sources of deception in my life, my father and Sally. The confrontation with my father was inevitable. The lease he had woven about my mother, painting her as an uncaring, absent parent, had shaped much of my childhood and early adult life. With Emily's support, I arranged to meet him, a meeting that promised to be as difficult as it was necessary. Sitting across from him in the quiet of a local café, the air heavy with unspoken truths, I began to unravel the fabric of deception that had enveloped our family. Why did you lie to me about Mum? I asked, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside. My father's reaction was a mix of defensiveness and regret. He spoke of his own pain and resentment, of feeling abandoned by Emily and fearing that she would take me away from him if she ever returned. His words, while revealing his vulnerabilities, did little to mitigate the years of mistrust and separation his lies had caused. I needed to protect our family, he insisted, but as he spoke, it became clear that the protection he spoke of was more about shielding himself from his own insecurities and less about my well-being. The realization was a bitter pill to swallow, but it also freed me from the web of falsehoods that had defined so much of my relationship with him. I can't let your fears dictate my life anymore, I told him. A declaration of independence, as much as it was an acknowledgement of our fractured bond. With a heavy heart, I left the cafe, leaving behind the father I once knew, and stepping into a future where I could define my own relationships and truths. The confrontation with Sally required a different kind of resolve. The manipulation and deceit she had orchestrated, feigning a disability to keep Benjamin and me close, had irrevocably altered the course of our lives. Accompanied by Benjamin, who had been my unwavering support through the tumultuous revelations, we faced Sally together. Sally, we know the truth, Benjamin began, his voice a mix of sorrow and firmness. We can't continue living a lie. Sally's response was a mixture of denial and acceptance, a tangled expression of her fears of loneliness and abandonment. But the time for excuses had passed. The damage her deception had caused to our marriage, our personal growth and our trust was too significant to overlook. We're moving on, Sally, I said, the finality in my voice mirroring the decision in my heart. We wish you well, but we can't be part of this anymore. Leaving Sally's house for the last time, Benjamin and I stepped into a world of uncertainty, yet one that brimmed with potential. With Emily's re-entry into my life and the painful yet necessary severing of ties, with those who had manipulated our goodwill, a path to healing and genuine happiness seemed possible. The confrontations had been challenging, each in their own way, but they had also been cathartic. They marked the end of a chapter defined by deceit and manipulation, and the beginning of a new one filled with hope, truth, and the promise of rebuilding. As Benjamin and I walked away, hand in hand, we knew that the road ahead would not be without its challenges. Yet the closure we had sought and found through confronting the past gave us the strength to face the future together. Our decision to leave behind the pain and embrace the opportunity for a fresh start was not just an act of defiance against those who had wronged us, it was a testament to our resilience and our commitment to forging a path defined by honesty, love and the true meaning of family. In the wake of confronting the tangled web of lies that had enveloped my life, I found myself on the path to recovery, bolstered by the newfound relationship with my mother, Emily, and the unwavering support of Benjamin. The journey from the depths of betrayal to the cusp of healing was marked not by grand gestures, but by the quiet moments of understanding and the small steps toward rebuilding trust. 
Emily and I, once strangers connected only by blood, gradually wove a tapestry of shared moments and conversations. These weren't just attempts to reclaim lost time, but efforts to forge a new bond, one built on the honesty we'd been denied for so long. Our meetings, often filled with laughter and sometimes tears, became the cornerstone of my healing process. Benjamin, too, played a crucial role in my journey. Together, we faced the challenges head-on, seeking therapy to untangle the emotional aftermath of the deception we'd endured. These sessions, though difficult, taught us to communicate more openly and to lean on each other, reinforcing the foundation of our marriage. The support didn't stop with Emily and Benjamin. Friends who had stood by us through the turmoil became integral to our recovery, offering laughter and distraction when we needed it most. Their presence was a constant reminder that we weren't alone, that the world was full of people who cared. As I looked toward the future, the scars of the past remained, but they no longer defined me. Instead, they were reminders of what I had overcome, of the resilience and strength I had discovered within myself. The dreams Benjamin and I had shelled, travelling, starting a family, suddenly felt attainable again, no longer distant fantasies, but imminent realities. The legal battles and the confrontations had forced me to confront my fears, to challenge the narratives I had been told, and to emerge stronger. I was no longer the person who had been manipulated by Sally or misled by my father. I was someone new, shaped by my experiences but not constrained by them. Standing at the threshold of this new chapter, I was filled with a sense of hope and determination. The path ahead was unclear, and I knew there would be obstacles, but I also knew that I had the strength to face them. With Emily's wisdom, Benjamin's love and the support of our friends, I was ready to move forward, to build a life defined not by the past but by the possibilities of what was to come.